Hello. 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 There we go. The third hello. That's going to be the new thing. Except we always leaned in. So now we can lean away. Yeah. Well, we lean into the computer now. Yeah. There we go. Um, Toby Gayette. Gayette, right? Do I, I pronounce that correct? Gillette. Oh You've my been gosh. pronouncing it silent this whole time. I thought it was French. What is it? It is French. It is French. Yeah. Oh you don't, well, don't know how to speak French. French. I don't, I don't you don't speak, speak French. Spanish or French. You <laughs> speak, speak Arabic. Arabic. <laughs> um, Toby, welcome, man. Thanks for taking thanks for taking the time out of your day to be uh, to be a guest on our podcast, my friend. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So. For those listening, Toby has been a client, a friend, a uh, person who puts pictures up that makes everybody on the East Coast and in between years extremely jealous. Um, but yeah, so we figure we just kind of, you have a very unique approach. You have a very unique story. Uh, we see you continually do the work and explore and be curious. And that's really ins- inspirational to us as not only like individuals, but certainly as, as coaches as well. And uh, so we wanted to see if you would gift us with your presence and your time. And we appreciate you doing that. So again, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks again for having me. And uh, thanks for, for creating what you've, you've built uh, with Between the Ears. It certainly helped me a lot. <laughs> Tell me a lot. Um, and it's been, it's been, I don't even know how many, years i've been your client but i think it's been maybe three years um two. how did you kind of get into so how do you remember your first interaction with between the ears or bill or sort of how did you get linked up with it all what yeah well it's my brother steve uh steve collette he's he lived by you guys and his wife michelle so shout out to steve yeah. up in up in maine now mm-hmm. um yeah he introduced me to you guys um it was uh i think he went to one of your events and came back from that like just a, a different person in all the right ways it helped him over some big hurdles that he was dealing with um and trying to work through and you know, he was always working, he's always been working on something, but this was like a huge change, a huge shift. We noticed it was like the shift he needed Mm -hmm. in his life. And I was super impressed with that. Um, more so just, you know, happy for him. And then time, some time transpired and he reached out to me and, and, and said that you were, offering a different sort of program that was virtual and that was the practice uh, 1.0 and he said that he thought that we could he and i could both participate in the practice and um i live in san diego so he at the time was you know i guess maybe transitioning between new jersey and maine making his move and uh, the fact that we could, you know, work on something together across the country was really cool. Yeah. Um, but something that he was, you know, really passionate about, um, and that I trusted him based on his positive experience with you guys. So, you know, Steve's been just, he's been an amazing older brother. I got super lucky in that department, you know, um, he, he's a unique, unique guy where he's just super driven and uh, there's not a lot of people like him out there. And so he's always pushed me to, um, to try to reach my own potential. And, uh, he's always been a guiding light. He's always been a, a couple few years ahead. Like he is four years older, uh, but he's always been uh, on the cusp of the newest thing or has, is always like into something. And then a couple of years later I try it and I'm like, why did I wait two years <laughs> right, or right. three years to get into this? There's been so many examples of that along the way. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the backstory there. And, um, after the practice 1.0, I continued on to do, uh, the practice 2.0 by myself. Yeah. And I had a great experience with that as well. Cause it was definitely different because, it was more just me on my own. But what was cool about 
working with um, with the practice 1.0 would be uh, like the topics of the week. Um, he and I would talk about them before. Uh, so we would receive the topic from you. He and I would talk about it and, and then we would go do the workout and we would, you know, journal about it afterwards. And then we would talk about what came up during those sessions. And it was like, I got extra out of every single experience because he knew, he knew things about me that I wasn't even, you know, aware of at the time, you know, being the older brother, being more, um, wise, but also, you know, all the work that he had done as well. So I was getting just so much out of it. Um, but at the same time, it was really uncomfortable. Like Mm -hmm. practice 1.0 was super tough for me in that department. Like it, it didn't feel good. Like not like it was like a big step back in many regards before I was able to make my forward progress, you know, that unraveling of stuff that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant at times for sure. Do you think you would have, did you consider, had he not done it, like, would you have, was it that bad that you would have quit or did you, did you feel like him doing it with you was what kept you going? Or did you just know, like, even though this is uncomfortable, it's, I know it's worthwhile and having seen his experience because he did a weekend. So he did immersion and that was a weekend. And for sure it was kind of a condensed, super intensive experience versus the practice. It's over so many weeks, yeah, but totally different. Yeah. But kind of knowing like, obviously there were some really uncomfortable parts in that as well, but seeing, you know, kind of seeing that he had come out of it eventually positive. Like what was it that kept you going, I guess? Um, yeah, the accountability of having him, him involved as well. That was, that was great. But also, um, knowing that, yeah, just the, the depth I probably, if he wasn't involved, I probably wouldn't have gone as deep. Mm-hmm. I probably would have. Cause I, I think I had some sort of preconceived notions that it was going to be more, more fitnessy oriented and less like really philosophical. Mm-hmm. And, um, I needed the philosophical. I didn't really realize it at the time. I was just kind of excited about some new programming or something like that. And that's not what it was at all. So, uh, he being involved, definitely kept me accountable and, and excited about each week, even though it was tough. It's cool to have that like safety and support and guidance from a, a, a wiser, you know, older brother figure as you explore and do that. And that's the thing about the practice that um, I really have a hard time figuring out where exactly this sort of goes because the concepts, the, 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 the depth to which we go is limited only to our, pretty much our willingness. But that's not necessarily saying if you're not going that deep, you are you know, intentionally unwilling. It's, it's, it's natural to hesitate going to some of those, I'll just say like those darker depths because of, uh, the overall experience of maybe what either contributed there or what led to that. And it's, it's not comfortable. So to have the connection piece from your brother, uh, on your journey is, is super cool. And, you know, that's one of the things, too, that I have to, like, I'm always trying to flip around, like, where's the ethical sort of responsibility where uh, when you start to do some of this deep work, how much care and nurturing and guidance can you realistically provide? And that's in person. Then you look at the online, the remote space. Um, So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to look at, but it's certainly one that, you know, I appreciate your honesty with saying, like, hey, like, kind of like a la a detox it was you're doing something that you think is going to be good for you and then all of a sudden it's working but it doesn't feel maybe <laughs> as if it w- w- as if what you thought it would at, at, at the onset for sure i think uh something you posted about recently though um 
in regards to journaling, I think that's kind of the, the key is that like the journal, that's your safe space. That's the non-judgment. That's the, you know, this, the place where you, you dump it all out there and you sort through your thoughts and, and you don't have to worry about anyone seeing it or reading it or, you know, judging you. It's just, I don't know. I, th- I think that was, I probably would have spent more time writing and less time talking about this stuff if, mm-hmm. if I hadn't gone through 1.0, you know, with, with Steve. Yeah. When were you journaling before between the ears or what was your journal practice like prior to? Yeah. Um, let's see. It was, uh, I got started with journaling with, uh, the five minute journal. Mm-hmm. Are you, are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, that's how I got the habit started a few years before that. And I like bought the, the five minute journal, um, through Tim Ferriss and his, you know, because mm-hmm. I think the story is his four hour work week inspired someone to start that company. That's so cool. that's why he was promoting that particular, um, device. And then I found like knockoff versions of it online that were just, you know, like the same format for like five bucks instead of 25 <laughs> bucks. And I filled, you know, a few of those as well over the years. Mm-hmm. So the idea was the same, yeah. um, but it was much um, shorter of a format. But mm-hmm. I think that's the point is it, it prompt, it was the same prompts is the same habit, you know, is the same uh, space that I carved out in my day for it, that kind of thing. And, but I, I never went as deep. I didn't, you know, have that blank page or pages to just go for it. Yeah. So going deep, a little transition here. You just completed David Goggins' four by four by 48 challenge. So you ran four miles every four hours for 48 hours two weeks ago. A week the ago. first weekend in March, right? Yeah, two weekends ago. Yeah, two weekends. You ago. started at the eight p.m. on the West Coast, or did everybody start yeah. at? A, yeah. Yeah. How deep did you go over those forty-eight hours? Um, I think I would say the first night was more of like a mental, a mental hurdle. Uh, because it was more of the unknown. It, I was more, I had like a lot of built up anxiety towards night one. Mm. Um, after night one, I had this sense of relief uh, about the entire challenge. Uh, like like you were, so just to back up a little bit, is this the, you have, you've done a lot of, um, this isn't like your first endurance type endeavor. I mean, no, no, this isn't, yeah. I've, done a, not, I've done a bunch. I just, I didn't have like a ton of, um, recent run mileage built up, Okay, but I have a decade's worth, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. uh, yeah. So was your anxiety, like, obviously, you know, you're going, you're not going to not be able to complete four miles. What was the anxiety? I'm curious. Cause I ha- I'm like the quintessential anxiety, like before anything, like, doesn't matter if I can do it or not, or just. What, where is that? What was that coming from? Um, it's a good question. I, because, like you said, yeah, it wasn't necessarily the physical. I don't think the physical ever, it, it was more of like the, the mental hurdle of, you know, setting like just, I don't, I'm not a person who works out at night. I'm usually a morning person. Um, so I was, fine with, you know, getting up at three forty-five for the 4am run on Saturday morning. Um, but it was more like, am I going to be able to sleep after running from eight to almost 9pm and then setting an alarm to get up at 1140, 1145 to run at midnight and be able to get back asleep. And it was really just, yeah, I, I was approaching it in a way that I wanted to get those um, those opportunities to sleep. I didn't want to just go two days without mm-hmm. sleeping. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to just me 
being a, a family man. Like I wanted to be around and present for my family during the day on the weekend. I didn't want this to be all about me. I wanted it to be um, just something I was doing and that could get woven into the fabric of the weekend. Um, and so I wanted to like downplay its uh, effects on me so I could be present uh, for, for the fam the whole weekend and still pull this off. And I think that's like speaks to just the longer term view of, of my fitness journey and how I've evolved from, you know, being way into this stuff. And that was my sole focus to being a father and husband and all that sort of thing. And, uh, so I wanted to get the sleep and, uh, when I, f and it was, you know, it's winter, but it's, it doesn't get that cold in San Diego compared to where you guys are. Um, but at, you know, eight 45 at night, I'm sweating buckets and, um, I'm out in the garage on the treadmill, which, you know, we can talk about that as well, but, um, going from, you know, the treadmill to like a cool shower. Like I had everything set up in our guest room just to shut it down quickly and get to mm -hmm. sleep and, um, had all and my clothes you? laid out for the next run, that kind of stuff. Um, making sure I didn't eat too much. I took the right, you know, like the nighttime was more of liquid calories or mm -hmm. liquid recovery. Um, I made up for it during the day with the more solid foods, that kind of thing. But yeah, after getting through the 4 a.m. run, I mean, the, the the night runs were, you know, they're weird, like getting up in the dark, like, like am tiptoeing I awake? around the house, like going out there. Just, um, it was, it was definitely strange for the first night. And, um, I think it was, it wasn't until, it wasn't after the 4 a.m. run that I felt the sense of relief. It was after the 8 a.m. Uh, because the sun was still, um, down for the 4am run. It was still dark outside. And it's to, you know, even though I usually get up at four, it was, it was, I was tired more so because of the night runs. So I ended up getting back to sleep, um, which was super helpful. And I didn't start to feel good till I had some coffee in me and it just reset my day and the sun was up after that 8am run that everything started to feel like, okay, I got this. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I know that feeling from, uh, from what they call Alpine starts from mountaineering, uh, where you start at 2 AM just for your approach to the climb. And, you know, you're groggy from waking up that, that early or late, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And, um, when the sun, the sun rises, you just get this like mm. renewed sense of, of life and appreciation. And you get small, I don't know. I get this like smile on my face and this, these goosebumps and I'm, and it's just this energy that's, I mean, you know, they say it's always darkest before the dawn that saying comes from like how cold and how pitch black it is right before sunrise. And I've seen that happen in my life so many times. So I, I knew that was coming, but I didn't know that it was going to come with such a sense of relief. I, I definitely yeah. felt after that, like I, I got it. Like the rest of the challenge to me, it was, I had already finished in my mind. Like I literally right, right. went there already. It's like, I got, I, I'm not worried anymore. Like I got this. So, were, so when you say you're not worried anymore, were you worried that you were going to, because because physically, like you mentioned, like that's probably not the thing. Like you could grind through that. Was it worry that it was going to consume and overrun your intent of having it fit within you? Because you're a family man and you want to be present with your family. Was it the worry that you're going to pretty much, you know, it's going to take over your entire family's weekend because of something else? Like talk to me a little bit about what you were actually worried about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's it. It was 
like that it was going to destroy me and I was going to turn into some drama queen. And that was just like, <sighs> oh my gosh, I have to go run. Right. Um, it's all about me. You know, no, I can't have breakfast with you. I need to put my legs up. You know, like I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be that, that guy. I wanted it to, uh, to just be smooth and just something I was doing, yeah. you know, oh, like I love it. be a positive force, not this sort of trading of this one thing for the other kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wanted to and, add to the excitement of the weekend instead of mm-hmm. take away from it. Did you have any moments where you were sort of, cause your kids are smaller Um, were there any moments where you're kind of like a little bit on the like burned out side or struggling with focusing or giving the attention or do you feel like pretty much you guys found like a, a good groove with the kids? We found a good groove. We found a good groove. That's awesome. And, uh, so I journaled about this. I talked to my buddy who was also doing, uh, the challenge, um, out of Colorado, um, Shout out to Paul Jesse. Uh, he and I talked about how it was it was kind of trippy the way that it was like so cyclical. Like you know the feeling of having a run coming up and you're thinking about the run, where you're going to run, what you're going to wear, pulling the gear together, setting up like the logistics for the run, going in, you know, lacing up, gearing up for the run trying to, you know, go to the bathroom before you go to the run, you know, get out there, start the run, feel like crap the first mile, you start to feel better. You have those chatter in your brain where it's like, why am I doing this? And then Mm -hmm. you get the answer. You're like, oh, I know I'm doing this. Now I feel good. And then you finish the run. You're like, yeah, I'm glad I did that. And then you feel like a little lousy for a minute. And when it starts to catch up with you, like when the runner's high starts to fade and then you you get some food in you and you're like, okay, all right. But then you feel a little achy afterwards. Yeah. I felt that 12 times right. in two days. <laughs> it was all yeah. of those, those, you know, emotions, the peaks, mm-hmm. the valleys times 12. It was crazy the way that it was so many reps within one weekend. Mm-hmm. Did you notice any, did you notice anything different from when that initial resistance set in to being able Because it sounds like, you know, you have that and everybody who does something that's challenging, there's those natural resistances to, ah, I don't really know, like, uh, like, you know, that, that, that normal sort of, Hey, you know, kind of keep it small, kind of, kind of chatter. Did you notice any quickness as you went on to being able to kind of let that go and just sort of let it pass and sort of settle into then your, your state of presence with doing what you were doing? Absolutely. Yeah. It was like, I, I equated it to meditation and just like it's, it, it was its own muscle that I was developing <laughs> at, at a, like a, you know, high level, like a, a macro sense. It was, you know, broken up into all these micro experiences, but each one was me like catching myself, like in meditation where you, you're losing track and you're, you've got to, bring, bring, bring yourself your back, self yeah. back to your breath. And, and it was like seeing that story start to, to take place that story where I'm, you know, starting to talk in my head about like, what does this mean? Like, how does this fit in, in the bigger picture? And just like bringing it back to no, like, this is what I do. I, I run every four hours and just keep, like you said, keeping yeah. it small, yeah. keeping it simple. Um, but yeah, it felt like a, a weekend long meditation almost. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, and uh, that's the thing about, I think that's the thing about cyclical repetitive things where you, that's why like meditation is obviously super powerful, but from a movement standpoint, we can create these similar type of experiences where we have, you know, a, a, a pattern of behavior that in involves our body, that involves our mind, that involves our emotions. And I think that's one of the things that is so, I think it's underappreciated by l- virtually everyone outside of the endurance community where it's like, well, let me ask you this. How did it feel when you finished? 
when you crossed the finish line, so to speak? How was that? Uh, so I didn't have any physical issues until mile 41. So the four, that took me to 4 PM on Sunday. I was feeling physically fine from the whole thing. I had some aches and pains in in my like hips and lower back that came and went and they were gone. And then I got this, um, this flare up in my right calf, uh, at mile 41. So I just started my second to last run. And that's when it hit me that I was like, Oh wow. Like I, I'm, this isn't just like in the back. Like this is, this is, um, this is going to be quite the finish. And that's where I had to, I had to go and, um, have that conversation with myself, uh, right away, which was, okay, like, is this an injury or is this just in something that's, you know, uncomfortable? Um, is there a way to work through this? Can I, you know, going down that entire diagnostics list. Right. And from my experience from ultra running, like I've developed this like dashboard in my brain with all like, like the, the podcast switch device that you have in front of you. Like those are like the different levels that I see with like, you know, salt, sugar, you know, carbs, fat, like all that stuff. I can see that readout in my brain. And, and so I'm like, mitigating risk at this point saying, if I keep going, am I going to permanently injure myself? Right. Am I, if I keep going, am I going to, um, throw off the the goals that I have for the rest of the year? And, you know, I've had these conversations a lot because I've pushed myself to absolute physical limits and, and beyond. And I have done damage that's, that's lasted months or years, uh, for, for pushing that hard. And, and my intent going into this was to not do that, uh, to learn from my past and be wise about this. So I really struggled in that second to last run and with those conversations. And so I dropped the speed down and this was, you know, part of my whole approach was to be on the treadmill and, uh, be in the house the whole time and not have to drive to go run. Mm -hmm. Uh, We live in like a crazy hilly neighborhood. So I would have to, you know, drive a a few miles away to find somewhere that was consistently flat. So I was on the treadmill. I could monitor my, my speed and I dropped it down to a walking pace and the pain went away. And I was like, all right. And, And I went up a couple clicks on the speed and I found that, that threshold for where it wasn't hurting. And I just started chipping away at the miles and, um, it was taking way longer than my past runs, you know, and that was playing with my, my, Mm, my head a lot Yeah, saying, you know, my average pace for the whole experience is now dropping and, you know, that kind of thing and getting texts from my buddy, Paul and, and Austin who they had just finished. And, you know, I was like, I still had a couple miles left. That was playing with my brain as well. I was just, you know, not in a good spot at that point. <clears throat> and then I was able to, uh, it, the pain went away and I clicked back up the miles and I ran for, for not as fast as I was before, but I found that, that speed that I could cruise. And, you know, it was, at that point is like maybe five and a half miles an hour, which is like a 12 or 12 and a half minute mile or something like that. It's like, this is what I usually end up running during ultra marathons anyway. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? Like, this is, this is what it is at this point. It's an ultra marathon. I'm grinding this thing out. How much like going into it though, the data, like how much did that matter to you? Or what's your relationship, I guess, like with data, the numbers, the times, like in your experience with fitness, I guess. Um, Typically, when it comes to data, uh, I don't obsess over it. Um, when it comes to like my performance, um, I I usually try to track just like time on feet and elevation gain and and mileage, and that's it. 
Like that's all that I really care about. Um, because I know like, you know, the terrain differs so much when you're out there, like it, it's all, it's all, um, it all averages out to me to like, you know, five, I usually end up averaging like at the end of the day, um, five miles an hour. Like mm-hmm. that's just what we end up covering. Yeah. You know, right. it's like a, whatever, 14 something minute mile. Um, I always joke about that. Like I just, when I tell my wife how long I'm going to be gone, I'm just like, well, it's per- five, we're doing 20, you know, 20 miles. So five miles an hour right. <laughs> plus driving. Um, yeah, well, I, I, cause to complete my thought from before the repetitive cyclical, giving yourself those, giving yourself like every my every interval. So that was like, let's just say your 11th round, mm-hmm. you, you had, you got to a place where you're able to really have that internal dialogue, bring up that dashboard, mm-hmm. be honest with yourself, explore, you know, from a you know, like you said, like, is this an, <clears throat> is this an injury or is this an inconvenience? Mm-hmm. But you have to get there. Those first 11, th- those first 11 rounds got you to the table to then have that conversation to then say, okay, this is where I'm going to connect with. Yeah. I don't want to have my meniscus, you know, shatter or, or, or tear in half or whatever, which is going to then have my, the family pay the price and, and, you know, the waterfall kind of effect. And I think that's the thing about these longer efforts. And it's, you know, I'm speaking to the, to the, to the choir master essentially here, but that's something that's so underappreciated. I think when it comes to maybe more, you know, traditional functional fitness, higher intensity training, <clears throat> where the focus is, let me finish this as fast as I can. Let me get from start to the finish line. But it's that 11th round where you're able to then say, because it sounds like what you, know, what you did is something super powerful, which is like delaying buy-in to the, to the present experience. You know, we have something come up so often and we attach, we buy into it and we put the attachment to it. And then we make a, and then we project it and we extrapolate it and we say, oh, this is definitely my meniscus tearing in half. When in fact, it might've just been like, whatever your foot strike the it could have been any number of things but you were then being able to say okay well i can do something in the presence of this thing and 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 work through it and when we only look at task completion and speed of task completion we miss over or we skip over such an incredible much more deep uh, experience with ourselves that then leads us to be able to, you know, have those types of, you know, life lessons through fitness kind of thing, um, which is, which is, I think, really cool to hear that firsthand from your, you know, because ultimately it's like, great, you did it. What'd you learn? Uh, how, how'd it go? Like, you know, and I think that's to hear that that was your experience is awesome. Like, that's, that's really, really cool. Yeah. It's almost as if the, the real challenge didn't start till mile 41. Yeah. yeah. We used to have a saying, like when I was in the military and stuff, and you know, and we had some pretty, pretty long endurance stuff. Is the military loves endurance stuff? You know, you're having long range movements overnight, this and that. But it was always that moment. I had a thing where it was like when there was that significant adversity and challenge, and just really like the the point of frankly why you go in and do hard things and it's like well now i'm here everything i did beforehand got me to this exact moment right now and now i'm here and in that opportunity in that mm-hmm. window now it's a question of who am i going to be how am i going to be and it's like a partnering with that experience that i i just i love that about i love that about endurance i love that about longer efforts um, but it's kind of funny because you don't go, of course you don't go into it like, Ooh, when's the, when's the moment going to come? I mean, I had that with my half Ironman and, you know, in many ways you think like, well, I hope it goes great. I mean, but then when things were really uncomfortable and painful, I, I don't reg- like, I'm glad I had that opportunity because it was that, I mean, and we had talked about it before, but it was sort of like, okay, did I, 
was my goal to get through this completely unscathed and just be like, well, that was good. Like, of course not. Um, then it would have felt sort of like, well, what, what was I missing? You know, I kind of missed something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I remember having a conversation with Chris Hinshaw, who's, you know, the aerobic uh, capacity and the coach for the CrossFit athletes, uh, and their endurance endeavors. And he had said at one point to me that, you know, that was the one thing that a lot of the games athletes, they never went long enough to get that. Like they didn't ever get that experience, not from a physical, not just from physical, but just that mental side of like being in it for so long. I mean, that's why so many between the ears, not culminating events, but like bigger things. They're long. They are long. Yeah. Like, 999 the bike or whatever other sort of things we've done steve can attest to some of that other people have done events mm -hmm. um, but even the shorter things like there's a couple not to you know in the practice where there's this i was thinking of like the cyclicalness yeah. of like i'm still doing this and it might not be a a five hour thing but there's that cyclical nature where you there's a tendency for the mind to get kind of overwhelmed a little bit like oh my gosh i have this much or whatever. And you just sort of have to like, and that's obviously the, one of the benefits yeah. and the values of it, but just bringing yourself back to the current state. So I guess you can do that with, to your point, like there's a lot of opportunity for that in movements we do in anything we're doing really. Um, it doesn't just have to be a 24 hour endurance event. That reminds me of uh, current plus one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And that's what I think, and I can't, so Toby, you, you sent me some, you sent me that, um, you sent me that screenshot from that thing that you have. I'm being, I'm speaking in code because <laughs> someone's birthday is coming up and they don't know what it is. Kay's birthday is coming up. We should so just edit. We'll edit this part out. <laughs> <laughs> there's something you have apparently that Bill. But there was, there was. And it's from the the magazine or thing or what, the book of the yes. nonprofit thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's like the duality of that as well. There is that understanding. And, and, and when you sent that to me, I was like, yes, I love it. Because there is that, um, you think of your, you think of like who, like connecting to yourself and, and, and discovering yourself. And there's, there's different ways of doing it. There's that sort of, this is me inside out mass sort of expression of we'll say you know crazy hard sprints on the bike or sled push or like just run up a hill or whatever those types of things are one rep max type thing and then there's that withering away dissolving of punching through the layers of the endurance piece um and we see both of that i think that's what that's where when we look at fitness as a way to understand who you are there's so many entry points for that. There's, it's not just a single modality effort because that's just then, like, for example, cooking. Like, I cook the same thing all the time. And it's like, well, yeah, that's food, but that's, that's I'm, I'm leaving so much out as well by, you know, only making, yeah. you know, grilled cheese and hot dogs. You don't make grilled cheese. I've and made you, a couple. You can't even make pasta. Bill actually put the pasta in the water before he boiled it. And he turns to Marcus, our 16 year old and I seriously, he's like, this is right. Right. And Marcus is like, please just get out of the kitchen. <laughs> get out. <laughs> um, but I like, that's a good, that is a good analogy to it. There's, there's, there's this old special forces adage where there's a board of wood and there's a bunch of nails in it. And the, the mission is to remove the nails from the board. And conventional sort of thinking, conventional warfare thinking is, okay, you get a cat's claw or you get a pry bar or you whatever, and you, you know, fucking dig that thing into the board, you find the head of the nail and you pry that son of a bitch out. And that takes a lot of effort. It's kinetic. It's this and that. And then there's sort of the unconventional warfare element, which is, yeah, there's a bunch of nails in the board. What are we going to do to rot the board and set the conditions and set the environment so we rot that board? so that we don't actually have to go in there with the cat's claw and the pry bar and everything, but we're going to rot that wood. And it might take time. It might take a long time, but it's going to be a, a different approach to, to solving that mission set. And so I think that, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's those different types of experiences are similar in that, in that regard. For sure. 
We could burn it down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did you feel sometimes, like, how did it transpire over the coming days, weeks? Like, did you feel like the event changed after it? Or, like, kind of what was that experience in the, the wake of it for you? What did you, like, take away? Um. So... I I mean, I wrote a little bit about it in one of my Instagram posts after, and I think I was, I was seeking an answer to the question of like, am I, am I on the right path? And meaning, have I organized my life in a way that makes me capable of handling uh, a challenge like that? And I wanted to see, you know, when my, my breaking point might be, you know, like, and like I said earlier, I I don't have that much like consistent running mileage right now. And so this was more of like a mental test to me than a physical one. Um, and, but, you know, I got answers, I think, across the charts uh, <laughs> with the physical and the mental. And, you know, I think it just kind of goes back to my, like, how are, how am I balancing my ambitions with my abilities? Mm. And am I being honest about it? You know, and because I've had a lot of um, experience in the past of, you know, visions of grandeur and, 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 you know, planning out all this stuff, but not doing enough work, uh, physically to make it possible and then struggling during and not enjoying it and questioning, you know, the whole purpose of it all. And I'm always trying to, I think, fill in the lack of ability to meet my ambitions. I feel like my ambitions are always way higher than my ability level. And so, what has helped me working with you guys is, is, you know, living from my values and not for the results. And so I'm able to, to, to live on a daily basis, the way that makes sense for someone who has big dreams like that, that I'm, I'm making them um, achievable by my daily habits and my actions to get me there. And so I think that's just been the fundamental shift. So I got my answer that, yeah, I'm on the right track. If I had more weekly mileage, I would have breezed through that thing. But yeah, I have developed a lot of tools in my mental toolkit uh, to the point that now I just need to focus them on my my daily physical preparedness Mm -hmm. because... I have enough tools now to be dangerous. You know, I think I, I almost always have, right. um, mentally, but I continue to develop them and I need to use them, you know, to get me out into the garage gym and do the work on a daily basis, not to, you know, dream up the next giant mountain or event I want to try to take on. You know, I think that that was the biggest takeaway for me. So it sounds like this 48 hour mega, cause that's, I mean, that's a mega event. It's, it's two days. And one of the kernels of value is having that be the catalyst and the excuse to have something that's going to fully occupy, even though you did a great job balancing being present with your family, but that's, that's a full commitment. <laughs> um, learning from that and then saying, great, I'm going to extract what goes into being able to do that and really channel it towards next Wednesday where it's a non, nondescript, yeah. just like the normalcy. And it's that, not an event. Yeah. Into your practice, into your movement practice, into your where movement and, and fitness and everything kind of fits into, you know, giving an opportunity for these mental tools that you're sharpening and upgrading and then getting like top of the line tools too. Like, you know, you're graduating from the Fisher price little things to like the wall, like full on, you know, grade, um, that, that I think, I think there's so much, I think there's so much wisdom in that. And I think there's so much 
that is that's real like there's so much r- reality in that where it's not like the picture or the metal or the 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 finish line draping of the blanket you know kind of epicness but the the the, the consistency the I don't mean to downplay it by the normalcy but but truly how something that's a mega thing like this fits into the normalcy of your everyday I think that's well, I think it gets overlooked I think it's not well one it might be because people don't have the tools and two like it just like life takes over but you think of how many people do events and then it just fizzles like they really don't no carry through. that through um you know one week later it's sort of like it's over um whether regardless of how well they did how not well like whatever that experience was to even like capture it um and and you know that thought of like well what are you going to learn um you know, when I started training for that half Ironman, I didn't really think about it. And like Bill definitely challenged me with that question, like very early on. I was like, like, what am I looking for? Um, and so both on the front end and on the back end, not just during it, like really making the most out of what you can extract from it. Um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Your brother, Steve is is doing a phenomenal job of that as well. And he was another one that comes to mind. Someone who had an intent going in, had an experience during, and then is at the next start line, which is let me apply what I've learned. It might be one thing, it might be a dozen things, um, which is, I don't know, I get inspired hearing that. And sorry, I get inspired hearing that to just like, that's awesome. Like there's connection in that regardless of you know, what someone's doing in, in, in their everyday, the fact that they are doing that and that is their practice, I think is, I don't know, that's the stuff that fires me up. So you did the treadmill because of obviously logistics and the flat situation. Um, but what was that mentally? I mean, being on a treadmill is a very different thing than being outside both because you're not in nature, you're staring at the same thing, you're very cyclical, like, just curious about your experience of that treadmill. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, again, it was just, it just made more sense logistically than, than the alternative, which would be either running straight out, you know, the house or or driving. (laughs) Yeah. So were you going to maybe around, uh, because you weren't going to drive there. And then drive back, right? I mean, that were you going to camp there in bivouac or? No, 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 no. It's not that that's far. That's why it's, you do the treadmill. We're, yeah. yeah, we're talking five minutes down the street. Uh, um, okay, okay. I I just didn't want to have to deal with that. Uh, and we've got this sweet treadmill, so um, it just yeah. I I was able to you know we had good weather. I was able to open the garage door. Um, oh, we were doing great. a lot of home improvement projects that weekend, so. During the day, you know, my wife was walking in and out painting stuff and um, my runs were under an hour each. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was spending that much time per effort. Right, Um, right. And then uh, one funny thing was on uh, Saturday night, I set up the projector and watched the UFC fights. Yeah, I saw that. (laughs) It was awesome. Uh, like eight o'clock at night, I, I was like, I got to go to bed. I don't want to, I just paused it. I was like, not going to check my phone, no spoiler alerts. And I just started it back up again at midnight and watched the rest of them. A morale and it, boost. They timed out so perfectly with, uh, with my run times and everything. So, um, nice. that's cool. Yeah, that was cool. Um, I think those were like the, the main highlights, yeah. but you know, each one, I didn't feel so good at the start and then I felt good during and then I felt mm. good after. Yeah. So that was normalizing that, was cool. that process is so, I don't know how, I, I don't know. And me, I'm saying this to me as well. Like mm-hmm. it's so refreshing to hear that. Like, Hey, that's part of the deal, you know? And sometimes we, we just need to have that reminder, be it someone else's experience or our own, that that's sort of part of it. For sure. Oh, there's these uh, little built-in fans on the front of the treadmill that like blow air in your face. And I've never used them (laughs) until this challenge. I was getting really hot. Like, I don't know what was going on, but 
uh, my body went into this sort of mm. uh, state where when when you're you know you do that regular run and then you get however many days to recover before you run again uh, bouncing yourself out of recovery mode really messes uh, with your natural state of wanting to be in recovery mode still mm -hmm. um, I learned that when I was doing, uh, through hiking, I did, uh, the John Muir trail is 230 miles and we did it in, uh, like seven and a half days. It was like a marathon a day Jeez. for a week straight with 20 pound packs. And we were walking for average of 10 to 12 hours nonstop every day for seven days in a row. And at the end of that day, your feet are just like balloons and everything's inflamed. And all you want to do is stay off your feet for like the rest of your life. Um, oh my God. But you get up before the sun rises and like I would, I got up, you know, half hour before the rest of the guys and was like taping my feet up, getting my feet ready. Cause it was taking me extra time. And we would start walking, um, before the sunrise and eat our breakfast while we're walking and, uh, and just like tricking your mind and your body out of recovery mode is such, it's such a, yeah. a it really messes with you. Um, yeah. but it's also, like we said, it's also kind of like a muscle. Like if you can do that more often and get used to it, I think yeah. there's, there's something there for sure. But I think that's why my body temperature was like so high. Mm -hmm. Um, that whole time I was just like cooking, you know, like my metabolism was firing like crazy. I did a really good job on electrolytes. Um, I got some of that element stuff that's mm -hmm. kind of being advertised all over the place this year. Um, that was really easy to drink. And, um, I had one of those almost after every single run. So it was definitely keeping up on that stuff. I mean, and you have a lot of experience with the fueling. So that was probably pretty, pretty big. I think that's yeah. where a lot of people who are more amateur at it, the four miles is achievable for the average person, but you don't realize how that starts. Like anybody can get through maybe the first night and then how you recover or how day three looks and how the week after <laughs> looks is so important as as far as the fueling goes so that probably helped you feel good on monday i suppose no that's a good call yeah the fueling strategy is huge um i guess if i had to dumb it down i would say like liquid calories before and uh bigger stuff after mm -hmm. and um and then more during the day and less at night yeah. So your body can yeah. just rest and sleep at right. night. Right. You're not yeah, digesting. So, yeah. 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 so you're someone who is experienced, ambitious, driven, always, not maybe not always, but it's common for you to have like, okay, what's the next target? So what's next for you? Um, so right now, um, so I've been chipping away at a goal that began back in 2007. Uh, so I'm going on year 14 of, of working towards climbing all of the highest, uh, peaks in California. So there's 15 peaks in California that are above 14,000 feet. And over the course of the last 14 years, I've climbed 13 of them. So oh, two wow. left and, uh, I've pulled a date in June for the next 14 er in the Sierra Nevada. And I'm laser focused on preparing, uh, my body at this point, um, for a single day ascent, um, 20 miles, uh, 7,000 feet of gain and, um, day pack. So plus some climbing gear. So we're looking at probably 20 pound packs and my buddy, Paul, who also did the um, challenge out of Colorado, he's going to be out for it. So the two of us are going to team up and That's so leave cool. at midnight wow. on Saturday morning and go for as long as it takes, uh, in the single push from the trailhead. That's around 7,000 feet up to 14 and back in one day. 
Wow. What's the split in your mind as far as ascent versus descent? Um, like how do you how do you approach something like that? I, Seven thousand. That's obviously. That's, I'm great. That's, I'm great on the way down. <laughs> uh, I worry about above ten thousand feet. Mm-hmm. Usually is when altitude issues start to settle in. Um, so right around like the 11,000 mark is probably when I get a little in the past. Um, not every time, but I guess more times than not, uh, start to feel a little, um, nauseous because of the altitude. And, and so that, that push from like 11 to 14 and back, like just on the way down, I can actually feel better, cognitively, physically, everything, um, below 11,000 feet. That's just like Mm -hmm. that magic mark for, for my body. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've certainly gotten more used to it. I think there's like, um, some sort of your body, my body has a way of remembering it, uh, over time. Um, but I also feel like I've gotten more fit over time. Like being, you know, going from sea level to 14 and back in the same weekend is, you know, it's not, not smart, not (laughs) good. I don't know. It's, you have to make up for it with like being extra fit. That's my whole thing. Right. And I feel like the functional fitness, um, high intensity interval training, that kind of, uh, work, gets, gets me more ready for it, it. It compensates for not getting up to altitude that often in the meantime, like I'll try to get up to altitude above 5,000, above 6,000, uh, a couple times before. And then maybe like my key training session to get above 10,000, um, in, in the workup towards, towards the trip. Um, so that, that 11 to 14, like that's, that's the, the zone that worries me. Um, uh, but once I get it under 11, start to feel good, uh, my, I've got good quads for the downhill. So I'm usually in good shape at the end, uh, of these things. So it's, nice. it's all about the ascent at this point, like just wrapping my head around that. But also this one has some technical climbing at the very top. So being in a place where, you, you know, you haven't, let it all go just to get there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what mountaineering teaches you is like, you got to get down safely. Getting to the top is halfway, um, that, you know, making smart, intelligent, safe decisions at that height as well. Cause there's this, you know, sunk cost fallacy that can get you into trouble at that, right. at that point where you think, you know, I've come this far, you know, might as well keep going or I need to keep going. Um, that's, that's a skill that gets developed over the years. If you're lucky enough to survive that long. Right. Um, so I don't know. I think it's, it's all about at this point being super fit so that none of those issues come up when you get up there. That's kind of the approach. Yeah. It's funny. You know, I think that's, what's so cool about what you do and why we love your pursuits and your endeavors because fitness, um, your pursuit and commitment to a fitness practice is to allow you to do the things that give you joy and connection and socialization and uh, with others, with yourself, with nature, with all of these things. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're building a very effective, insertion tactic is essentially what it is no different than if you were to make sure your shocks or your tires or your whatever you know on 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 your vehicle that's fitness fitness is an insertion tactic approach uh for you to do the things that you know you'll dedicate 14 years to i mean that is that is awesome yeah. you know to say yeah hey the idea of i'm going to do this grandeur right that you talked about before but then that consistent approach and follow through and over a decade. I mean, that is, that's cool. What have you, I mean, obviously your training has changed, I would think since 2007, (laughs) like what have you learned 
what are you doing now that maybe you weren't doing then? It's vice versa. It's changed so much. Yeah. I was, I was so young and clueless, um, back then. Um, so I, I feel like this sort of, you know, the mountaineering aspect, it, what I love about it is that it pulls from so many different areas. It pulls from ultra running, backpacking, rock climbing. Um, I mean, it, it, those are like the main ones I would right. say. And then, you know, it's like the ultralight gear you're kind of pulling from like the, the ultralight um, world or even, even some of the kits now where it has like the upfront harness, you know, it's like almost military or hunting esque, and like, it's the blending of all these skills and it's, and it's being open to new ideas and, and, you know, like tinkering with my gear and, and cutting off straps and sewing stuff on and, and making it mine, you know, like my system, my, my, my kit, um, like that's evolved over the years. Um, certainly. And, you know, going on trips and coming back and being like, okay, what's, you know, what items didn't I use at all? And do I not have to bring on the next trip? You know, having those like after action reviews, that kind of stuff, or, um, you know, I brought, enough food for a week thinking that maybe something would go wrong. And I was carrying, you know, five extra pounds of food that I didn't even want to look at because right. as soon as I got over 11,000 feet, I really was craving this, you know, so like yeah. you learn about yeah. yourself over time like that. Um, and then, you know, back in the day I would just have like energy gels the whole time right. when I first started. Right. And then I would feel terrible, terrible. for days yeah. afterwards and my diet's changed big time. So I don't even have to eat as much, um, more like fat heavy, like more keto, but I would say more like flexible. So I can have those carbs during the effort when I need it. Um, when I, you know, like being able to bounce back and forth between right. fat and carbs while out there. Um, let's see, uh, what else has changed? I mean, you know, just having like the biggest backpacks and all the stuff to now like almost going out there and like the, you know, this, the smallest kit possible, yeah. right. It's right. just evolved so much. Um, I'm trying yeah. to think of some of the other examples. Cause yeah, 2007, I had, I can't believe like we climbed the face of, uh, of this, this 14 er and like a, hailstorm came around the corner next to Mount Whitney, which is like the highest mountain in the lower U S and I'm roped up like five pitches into this climb. I'm watching this hailstorm come around the corner towards oh us God, I'm looking gee. up. I'm like, we're like halfway there. Um, just feeling like, what am I doing with my life? You know, <laughs> you kept going. to, to like the last 14 year I went on, uh, with my buddy, it was his final, um, 14 year in the, in California. And I, it was a repeat for me and I had this game plan for us and everything went perfectly. It was like uh -huh. the easiest mm. seamless effort ever. I was like, wow, I didn't see that coming, but I guess that's what happens after, you know, working towards this yeah. stuff for a decade, you, yeah. you do get those, those, you know, gems of a, of a go. Um, so yeah. So when the hell, when the hailstorm came ripping around, what did, did you guys like just, hold off, keep going. What was that? Just kept going. Just, Just kept, kept going. going. Yeah. Yeah. To sweep the, the hail out of the handholds. <laughs> Jeez. It was awesome. Are you, you don't have to say what it, which it is, but back in 2007, did you say, this is going to be my first, this is going to be my last kind of bookends is, is the last one you're doing. Is there any significance to that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the first one that I did, I was roped up to uh, my friend Gil, who I moved to San Diego with after college. We went to college together. And that, that was, um, I was, and then we had another rope team with us, Albert, Lynn, and uh, Jake Felderman. And 
so the four of us summited together and, um, I mean, we all went on to do lots of different things. Uh, Albert works for national geographic. He's got a show on that geo now. Wow. Uh, Jake's a lawyer in Colorado. Um, Gil passed away, uh, climbing, um, in Peru the week that my wife and I got married. And so over the years, like it's almost become this sort of tribute to, to Gil yeah. who, uh, who passed. And cause I learned like, he's the one who convinced me to move to San Diego. He, I, I learned so much from him. I got on this great path because of his influence and I always knew like having a big mountain, like a, a 14er on my calendar each year would make me organize my life in a way that would be righteous, would be good, would make me make good decisions, would help me, um, be more organized and, and have, have that longer term vision. And I mean, I've just learned so much from having these things on my calendar every year to, to, um, just keep me honest. And, um, after he passed it, it was, it was, you know, more obvious to me that I just need to keep going on this quest because, um, he would be proud of, you know, who I've become and the fact that I stuck with it. And, you know, like I remember when we drove across the country, um, together to move here, we were rock climbing for my first time ever in like a cave in New Mexico. And, and it was so fun. And right when we moved to town, we got memberships at the local climbing gym and got started, you know, and he, he took it and ran with it and, and got super good at climbing um, and I, uh, was struggling just to get to the, um, the base of the climb because I was out of shape. And so I started running and that's what got me into running. And I started to love running more than I like climbing. Um, I felt like the traditional regular rock climbing was just a little boring for me. It wasn't like action packed enough mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I felt great after I would run. So that's took me down that path and he went down the, the climbing path. So it's, uh, it's cool how I've been able to kind of take from each area, bring it back, but keep this, you know, longer term vision. Um, and I've kept, um, Mount Shasta as the last one, because, uh, when we were roommates one night, we were, uh, we were in our kitchen and he reached into the fridge and pulled out a Shasta Cola. I've never told this story like in, in this capacity, but he pulled out a Shasta Cola and he looked at me and he looked at the, the Shasta Cola and he goes, dude, let's climb Mount Shasta this weekend. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And it's like on the other end of California, right? It's like on the, the border <laughs> and we're on the Southern border. And he goes, let's call REI. And I was like, all right, that's a great idea. <laughs> so we called up REI and we were like, uh, we want to climb Mount Shasta this weekend. <laughs> and they're like, uh, you need to talk to um, Eric. And we're like, all right, all right. And Eric gets on the phone. We're like, Eric, we want to climb Mount Shasta this weekend. And he's like, uh, do you guys have any mountaineering experience? We're like, no. He's like, do you uh, have any glacial navigation experience? We're like, no. And he, he's like, he goes, uh, well, how about you start with um, San Gregonio Peak this weekend? And we're like, okay. We're in, ended up being like the highest mountain in Southern California. And we went and had amazing experience on that. And that completely launched everything. I mean, I ended up becoming friends with Eric at REI. We did. Oh he's Good like an incredible have. ultra runner in Colorado. Um, he's done the Nolan's 14 route, which is, um, insane. 
in its own right. Um, he took me on a 27 mile, uh, nine peaks traverse across the San Bernardino mountains taught me about use like this is before back before even, um, they made arm warmers for running specifically. We were using like cycling arm warmers while, while out on the trail. Like he taught me all these cool little tricks and, um, and yeah, it just sent us on this cool path that, um, I've always wanted to get back to Shasta as the final one. In fact, I don't know that much about the peak on purpose. I have, I've mm. always just kept it as like, yeah, that's the last one. That's mm. I'll, I'll start reading about it and learning Cross about that bridge it when you get to it, when yeah. I have earned the right to, yeah. and, um, my buddy, my buddy, Austin, who also did the, um, he did the, the four by four by 48. Um, he works for uh, a three letter organization. He has, uh, some of, uh, Gil's ashes still. Mm. So I'm going to try to put oh, something wow. together for that last, yeah. that last climb, awesome. kind of get some good closure on that. Wow. Toby, that's beautiful, my man. Thank you for sharing. That was, uh, I'm, I'm, you can't see it, uh, but I've got goosebumps all, all around. That was truly beautiful. Right on. Thanks for letting me share that. Yeah. I think after that, uh, I think that's I think a we're, good, at, uh, we're at a good place. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're looking forward to, I'm going to do the podcast thing and say, if people want to, not that you're documenting, you know, your journey necessarily, but if people wanted to see some of those envious pictures and cool stuff and, and your artistic eye and what you're into, how can they, uh, if you're comfortable, if you don't want to disclose that, I should have probably asked you that before. If you just want to. No, it's a public account. Yeah. There we go. Okay. I yeah, wasn't just, sure if you were private or not. Yeah. Just my name, Toby Gallette. Uh, on Instagram is usually where I share most of that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do some Instagram stories when I go out and do like a, a fun, like weekend sort of training thing, but usually just post pictures and, um, every Coffee now and set then, up and yeah, I'm always every like, now oh, and again, I'll go so deep good. on some of my, uh, captions, but I usually just keep it kind of fun. Just, you know, yeah. just yeah. posting what I see and, try to do good balance of family fitness and just cool photos yeah. and stuff that I see. Yeah. Awesome. Toby, you're a good dude, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Um, thank you really for having me. This. You guys are awesome. Love everything you've built. It's just helped me become so much better of a version of myself and helps me show up better for my family and my friends. And so thank you. Appreciate it, brother. All right, guys. Yeah. All right, then.